Hi, I'm Lori Netherow with Buckeye Valley Beef, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about a um, marketing project that we took on for our SARE grant, um, and I'll even introduce to you, if you're not familiar with the SARE grant, um, a little bit about what it is and how to apply um, yourself if, if you find interest in this topic. So um, we're going to go through a little bit about who Buckeye Valley Beef is, our um, Sarah, North Central SARE grant and the process to apply, the uh, study that we, uh, we got our funding for, uh, the findings of our study, uh, the lessons that we learned, uh, and then what you can do in your individual operations or at your family homesteads um, to implement some of the strategies that we talk about today. So as I mentioned, I'm with Buckeye Valley Beef, um, and Buckeye Valley Beef is an agricultural cooperative that um, Ohio's uh, Extension Office helped us create back in 2016. One of our um, members um, had an idea to collaborate with other small farms um, so that we can provide a year-long product um, to customers instead of just you know once a year or a couple times a year. Um, and that maybe we can even um, out, be a resource to larger operations like restaurants and grocery stores. Um, we do uh, provide our beef to some local butcher shops. We've collaborated with some restaurants, including one in, in Columbus. Um, and uh, so I'm excited about um, what the future holds for the cooperative. And here is a short introductory video that we had created. Uh, for our co-op uh, to give you a better idea of who we are. Buckeye Valley Beef was started in 2016 by a few local farmers here in Southern Ohio. We wanted to find a way to sustain our living on the farm as well as provide a product which we thought was as a high quality to consumers. The Bolinders approach each family about forming a cooperative as a way to provide a consistent product year round. And the only way that we can do that is together. We feel like we have a great product that stands out because we're taking those core values that our parents and grandparents taught us and trying to perfect them to adapt to today's food market. One way we're able to adapt to today's food market is through direct marketing, which allows us to connect with each customer and build a relationship. Our dream of Buckeye Valley Beef is to not only grow our individual operations, but to grow the cooperative in a way that strengthens our local food community. So, um, as I mentioned, we are an agricultural cooperative, and um, you know, as with any business venture. Uh, a cooperative doesn't come with any shortfallings. Um, we have um, minimal working capital because most of the money that we make in the cooperative goes back to the farmers. Um, we take a small fee from each of the cattle sold uh, to pay for advertising costs, working um, things like uh, supplies and shipping, um, utilities, uh, any of those types of things. Um, so. We don't have a whole lot of money to waste um, on anything. Um, and when we first started, uh, nobody knew who we were and we didn't know how to get our name out there. 
Uh, so we wanted to find what was most productive for small farms um, and cooperatives. And um, as you'll find, if you start doing research in this area, you won't see a lot of research done by small operations and small family farms um, or agricultural cooperatives because there's just not a lot of us. Um, so we wanted to look into what advertising methods worked for our types of businesses. Um, you know, we're, we're different than, you know, a carpet outlet or a Walmart, um, McDonald's. We, we may not work the same way or attract customers in the same manner. So we wanted to um, do an experiment and find out what works so that going forward, um, we can make sure that our very limited resources are put to good use. Uh, and that was the point of this um, grant proposal that we submitted to North Central SARE. And I, I see a comment about the video. Um, it, one of the things that's outside of the scope of this presentation, but um, one of the things we've also learned since the implementation of this uh, grant um, is that video um, advertising, YouTube, and those types of outlets are an, another great resource. Um, uh, and with the invention of TikTok now, um, to reach out to um, for uh, building a customer base. Maybe somebody else can do a SARE grant to look into that. So um, the North Central SARE grant um, was actually um, presented to us by one of the um, South Center members um, for Ohio Extension. And um, they had mentioned that there was a grant process out there that, that gives money to farmers and ranchers who are looking to do research and education on sustainable agricultural pro um, products. And so one of the, the areas that you can research in is marketing. And that's the area that we chose to go. Um, and we are a group. So we went for the grant that's up to 27,000. Um, but if you're an individual operation, you can apply for up to 9,000 or a team of two is 18. And that data may be a little different this year. That was taken from the 2020 one um, information. So it may increase each year um, so when you go to check it out. Um, just look into that. They fund about 50 projects a year. And I will tell you, this was not our first attempt. Um, we applied uh, the previous year before we were actually accepted. Um, and we went through the peer review process and took their notes seriously. And then we revamped our, our proposal the following year. Um, and that's when we were awarded the grant. Um, and the timeline, they, they do a call for proposals in August and by early December, the proposals are due and by February, they've made their decision and in the spring, you can start your projects and receive funding for those projects. Um, and then this was a two-year project for us. So we got, uh, some money up front to start the project. And then as we continued forward and submitted, um, progress reports, we um, continue to receive more funds and then at the end, a reimbursement. Um, so, you know, think about those things if you're interested or if you have an idea yourself, um, they welcome any and all types of research or educational proposals. So look into their website uh, to get more information. So our funded grant project, like I have mentioned, is to look at advertising channels um, for small family farms or agricultural cooperatives. And we uh, introduced four advertising methods. Uh, we did billboards, uh, radio ads, social media, and Google ads. And as we get to those slides, I'll talk to you a little bit about why we chose those methods. Uh, and then we measured the impact that those advertising methods had on our sales our customer reach and our self-reported exposure. And then we share the information with you all. So here's the timeline that we have. So we started off with Google ads and we did that from April to June of 2019. And then we wanted a break between each implementation so that we could account for any lagging uh, sales that might be attributed to a previous implementation. So we took a break in, June, in July, we reset, accounted for any lingering sales and then collected baseline data for August. And then in August, we implemented our billboard display until October. 
took a break in November, reset and, you know, created or gathered our baseline data. And then in December, we did our Facebook ads up until March. And as you'll see from March of 2020 to June of 2020, we started the pandemic. So um, some of that data may be a little skewed uh, in terms of COVID-19 um, impacting our sales growth, but we also will talk a little bit about why we think that might be a, a perfect natural experiment for us. Uh, and then in April, we implemented radio advertisements. So Google Ads. We chose Google Ads because we've been to prior trainings. Uh, we went to the B509 course at Ohio State University. And one of the uh, Beef Checkoff members that does their marketing there talked about how they've kind of drifted a little bit away from Facebook advertisements to more YouTube and Google ads um, instead of, uh, you know, social media. And we thought that was interesting because it seems like a lot of small businesses focus a lot on their social media accounts, making sure that they've got a public image out there so that people see them and know who they are. Uh, so we also hadn't really worked with Google ads much. Uh, we did a little bit. And it did seem to have an impact on our sales. So we decided why not throw that in there and see if we can compare and contrast the two advertising methods. So we have a budget of $3,200 um, approximately. Um, and if you're not familiar with Google Ads, we weren't. Uh, we, there are two types uh, in there. There may be more now, but when we did our Google Ad um, campaign, there were two types. There's display advertisements which are those that pop up on your newsfeed when you're scrolling through, or if you're on a blog and you see advertising on the side of it, those are display ads. And they are there, they're created from the, the cache from your computer, um, looking at prior browsing history, things that might interest you. So let's say I am on a food blog, you're gonna see advertisements for like HelloFresh or those types of companies that are targeting people who are foodies. Uh, and then there are search campaigns, which are the campaigns that we actually did. And that's when you're bidding on keywords for um, your opportunity to pull up at the top of the list on Google. So let's say you get on Google and you type in local beef near me. That is um, keywords that people are bidding for. And if you are at the top of that list, if you have a high bid, you're at the top of the list on Google and people will find you when they type that in. Um, so we used two search campaigns. We targeted our small bundles and then our direct to door deliveries. And then the other we used to target our bulk beef sales. So if you implemented these, you just kind of look at what it is that you're trying to sell to the customer um, and maybe do a search campaign for each individual type product. So each month, that we did this, uh, we would reevaluate and adjust our keywords. Almost always you have to do this because nobody, unless you're an expert, have a degree in marketing. And even then I still don't think you get it right the first time around, um, get your words right at first. We, we talk about our product in a more um, professional, we use more professional terminology, whereas our customers may not. So, you know, we might search for beef shares or um, I, I'm not even sure what else to say for that piece, but our customers will search like whole cow for sale. Um, or, you know, you might be searching for uh, cars for sale, but your uh, Buick salesman would think that you're searching for, you know, more specific terminology for that. So you might need to readjust your, your words that you're targeting to match what your customer is actually using. And we kind of listened when we went to our, uh, we had craft shows that we would uh, have our product at for sampling to customers. And we would listen to the words that our customers were using to describe our product um, and use that to figure out what types of wording we would need um, to, to bid on on Google. And then we used Google Analytics to track the progress. Um, and it's a beast in and of itself. And it took a lot of time for us to learn how to use both Google Ads and Google Analytics. So our Google Ad results were not 
like we'd hoped them to be. Um, this is our first advertising method. We were extremely excited to get started. And then we looked at our data and we had 15 customers self-report exposure to the Google ads. So not a whole lot. We had um, about $4,800 in sales attributed to those customers, which is a 50% return on investment. Um, you know, it's not horrible, but it's not what we had hoped when it, it takes us a lot to get the $3,700 that we invested um, to, you know, only return 50% um, to us. So we weren't, we weren't very excited about those results. Um, and, and also all the time that we had to put in to get those results. So um, that was our first implementation. So we reset, we gathered our new baseline data, and then we went about doing billboard displays. And the reason we chose those is because we had actually done yard signs prior to this, and we had them in various customers' yards. Any time somebody bought from us, we'd ask them if they wanted to put a yard sign in their, in their yard. And it works for some types of companies, you know, black top companies, roofing companies, you know, house cleaning companies, they utilize those yard signs and, and they work. Um, but do it, does it work for an agricultural based uh, company? Uh, and does it work on a large scale? Uh, we didn't know. So we wanted to test this out and see how it would work for us. Um, we chose Lamar companies because it's a big advertising um, billboard company out here in our area in Cincinnati. And um, they were great to work with. They helped us to design this billboard. We're farmers. We're not marketing gu gurus, so we uh, or um, you know graphic design artists. We we were not able to do this on our own. So they were able to do this for us, and um, we had a general idea of where we wanted to put our billboard, but we weren't confident. And so they had their marketing experts look at our data and uh, and kind of solidify for us where it needed to be placed. Um, so we ultimately decided to put our billboard above a major artery highway in Loveland, Ohio, um, which was a good area for us because it targeted a lot of the people who were kind of already starting to hear about Buckeye Valley beef and buy from us. So we had a $6,000 budget. And prior to our proposal to get this grant, we looked into all of these advertising methods and kind of looked at how much money did we realistically need for each of these. I would have um, severely underestimated the amount of money we needed for a billboard prior to doing research on how much they cost. Um, this was one billboard um, and it was $6,000. So um, a very expensive advertising method, um, but if it works, it works. So, and it wasn't our most expensive advertising method that we used um, in, this, in this grant. Um, and we also used um, our order form to track self-exposure to the billboard because it's not really something that's easily trackable other than asking the customer if they could um, tell us where they heard about us. So um, that's the method that we use to track. Um, we also did use Google Analytics for um, this type of method to see if there was any increase in um, website traffic to um, from the Loveland area, and there was. Um, so that was that was nice to see. But can we convert those website traffic um, people to sales? That was the question. So um, when we finished our three month period of time. We had no customers self-report exposure to our billboard advertisement. And so that was a um, big disappointment. Um, but after COVID-19 hit, we did have four more orders that were placed and they did select billboard as um, the method that in which they heard about us. And so we were able to eventually uh, attribute 3,700 in sales to our billboard advertisement. Um, which was still a negative 37% return on investment. So um, if you ask me, our billboard advertisement was the worst method of the four that we implemented. Um, but there are other, other areas that you can look at for billboard advertisement, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. So 
we took a month break and we reset and we gathered our baseline data and then we implemented our Facebook ads. Now this is an area that we had used for advertisement prior to our implementation of the Sarah grant. Um, we would play around with the boosted posts because um, you can add a dollar or two or five here and there and see how it worked. And we did notice the traffic to our posts increased and then the sales would often increase around those times. Uh, so we attributed this um, to a smaller budget uh, because we didn't need a whole lot to make this work. Um, and also we wanted to look at it from a perspective of how much would re we realistically use if we were doing this without any kind of grant funding. Um, and we have some teachers that are in our cooperative, so they're very organized and they helped us create a 12 week timeline for our posts, which I highly recommend if you're going to use social media as a means to advertise, to have a plan in place, maybe once a month, sit down, write out a calendar of ideas on what you're gonna talk about this month so that your posts kind of tell a story and, and, and all aspects of your business are highlighted for the customer to get to know you. Again, we used Google Analytics to track our progress. Once you learn that beast, it is so helpful um, in so many ways to um, kind of look at what your customers are doing when they get to your website and, um, and tracking sale progress. So um, it was helpful for us to learn how to use that. Um, and then we also used our order form to track self-reported exposure. So at the end of the day, we had 78 customers self-report exposure to our Facebook posts and they attributed to 66,000 in sales for us, which is a 10,900% return on investment, which we were flabbergasted by. Because as I had mentioned previously, they had some of marketing experts had, had decided that their companies were going to kind of stray away from Facebook advertising and go towards other uh, means. And this worked fantastic for us. Um, so it's one of the few advertising methods that we studied that we still implement on a daily basis. And then finally, radio ads. So we chose radio ads because we have a local radio company out here, um, C103. I don't know if anybody on the call is from um, Southwest Ohio, but uh, we have advertised periodically on the radio company um, at local games, football or baseball or um, basketball games. And uh, we had some success with that. So we wanted to look at it from a larger scale. And we took a big risk with this one because the amount of money that we had to put towards this ad or towards this um, marketing um, piece was uh, quite a lot, especially for a small farm. Um, and it, so $14,000 is nothing to sneeze at when you've got a small agricultural business that you're trying to get off the ground. Um, we did some good hard look at our data and our customer uh, base, and we decided that NPR was the best place for us to advertise on. Um, we looked at you know, 700 WLW and 105 and several others, and NPR had similar demographics to us. We, we reached out to all these companies, got budgets from each of them. And then we also, they will also provide you with a customer uh, demographic that tends to listen to their, their radio station. And then we compared it to ours to see which was the best fit. Uh, again, we're not marketing experts. So we were very appreciative when NPR said that they would create our 20 second ad for us. Um, and they use their own required language. We approved it and then we were on our way. Um, we had 22 slots per week where the customer would hear our name over and over again. And um, we had 348 slots in total. Now, if you were listening closely at the beginning of the presentation, you heard that our radio ads happened during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so, we are aware that our data could be skewed from that, but we also believe that COVID-19 was a great natural experiment because our, our, our experiment was to see what advertising methods brought in the most amount of customers. But 
COVID-19 might have been the reason that the customer bought, but we they heard about us somehow or another. And then when they were forced to buy, they reached out to us. And then we were able to capture very quickly the advertising method in which they heard about us from. Um, so if you had to force all of your customers or potential customers out there to buy from you all at once so that you could capture the best mechanism to reach out to them, COVID-19 did that for us. Um, so we had 30 customers self-report exposure to the radio ads which attributed to 27,000 in sales. And that was an 85% return on investment. So for a uh, marketing advertising method that cost so much up front, we were able to bring that money back in and then some. Um, so, you know, maybe if later down the road, as your companies get a little bigger, um, you might look into doing something like this. Um, NPR told us we were not the first uh, company that was associated with agriculture that used them. Um, and we, they have several that do it on a yearly basis. So something to look into um, for your individual operations. So here is a summary snapshot of what I've talked to you about so far. Um, and as you can see, uh, Facebook was our most successful implementation followed by radio uh, and then Google ads and then billboard. But I did want to mention some other notable findings. At the bottom of the page, you're going to see that 153 of our customers during the time that we asked for um, self-reported exposure um, said that word of mouth was how they heard about us um, or through a Google search. Both of those things can only occur if you have brand awareness with your customers. And where did they get that brand awareness? Well, we may not know for certain on the word of mouth or the Google search recipients um, that, that marked those on their order form. But I can tell you that these were the only four advertising methods that we were utilizing during this time period. So those can also be attributed in some fashion to one of the four implementations that have been previously discussed. Um, and it also goes to show that although we captured 101,000 in sales from our, our marketing advertisements, we continued to capture twice that amount or three times that amount later down the road um, because those customers then told their aunts and uncles and cousins and brothers um, about us. And then we built our database. Um, so marketing is not an area that you should take for granted in your businesses because it's extremely important um, to the success of your company and building brand awareness. So for those of you on the call who are more visual, here is a visual aid for you to kind of illustrate um, the areas uh, that have the most impact on our sales. All right, so the part that you're here for, um, the lessons learned from our study, um, and then what can it do for you? So as I've mentioned, and as you might have been able to tell, our findings surprised us. Um, we had been told that Google Ads was the way of the future, um, and for us, it was not. Um, and it was very difficult for us to navigate, and um, we feel like the only way for us to maybe gotten better results is if we had hired somebody who is familiar with this type of advertisement. And let's be honest, most of us don't have the working capital to pay somebody to come in and do that for us. Um, so it's just not practical for our, our business. Um, and then billboards was also not profitable. Um, it was the only one that we lost money on. Um, and we were disappointed in that. Um, but we weren't surprised. We, we kind of thought that would be the least effective of the four advertising methods. Um, now, some future studies, if any of you on the call want to take on your own marketing grant proposal, um, could reevaluate brand recognition um, by maybe placing several billboards in a targeted area and kind of infiltrate the area um, with your name to see if that has any different effect. Um, and then Facebook was very profitable to us. That surprised us, as we mentioned, because we weren't expecting to get the results that we got. Um, 
given the advice we'd received. And then our broadcast media advertisements was also surprisingly effective for us, um, especially with the amount of money that's needed up front to, to do this. So um, looking forward from our study, we recognize our data might be skewed from COVID-19 and that maybe one of you ambitious folks on the call might be interested in taking on your own marketing SARE grant to try and replicate our findings. Uh, so we can make sure that everybody else out there um, can trust that the data that we, we receive from our product project is valid and reliable. Um, like I had mentioned, COVID-19 was an, a beautiful natural experiment for us because it forced people to buy during the end of our project and we were able to capture those sales. And then um, brand recognition, word of mouth, and Google search engine optimization is very important. If you've never heard of Google SEOs before, I highly recommend that you look into them. It's out of the scope of this project, although I can answer questions for you towards the end if you have any, um, but it's extremely important for your customers to be able to find you when they need you. Um, and so building brand awareness and word of mouth um, and having good SEOs can do that for you. So your next steps. Um, we highly recommend that if you don't already have one, that you cre create a website. Um, we used Wix.com to do that. And it's very user-friendly. We have no marketing or IT backgrounds. And we were able to do that ourselves. Um, and a very cost-effective, if I remember correctly, it's about $300 a year. So extremely cost effective. Um, I also worked with um, Ohio South Centers um, and they created a video to um, the public on um, different advertising or different websites that people use. So you could look for that information out there. Um, some people use um, Shopify and um, other types of um, website, WordPress, those types of things. Um, but Wix was worked for us. The other thing that we recommend is that you create a business page and um, such as Google, Bing, and Yahoo. You just go to like my Google business and set up your profile. Uh, that's what you use when you go and you search uh, little Kroger uptown to see when their hours are. Um, that is the Google page that, that they've created that somebody maintains. Um, so make sure you set one up for your own business because people rely on that to know how to call you, how to get your website, to see pictures and reviews of your business. Um, so make sure you're, you're going to all those popular search engines and creating that. Uh, I took a class on my Google business and didn't realize how important it was to your, your business, but people um, look at that for reviews and um, the more you post on it, the higher you get on Google's list for um, when they search your company name. Um, so when we first started out, if you search for Buckeye Valley Beef, hardly anything came up. But now if you search for us, we've got a couple pages worth of data that point back to our website um, from various uh, newspaper or magazine articles um, that have wrote things on us that bring back the customer to our website. Um, my Google business also helps you with that. And there's courses out there that you can take on how to um, utilize that the most, in the most effective manner. We also started a blog. And the reason for that is that we want to keep um, traffic going to our website uh, as much as possible. It refreshes our page and, and you know, lets Google know that we're still present and people still want to know who we are. Um, and again, it helps with your search engine optimization. Make sure you keep a strong social media presence. This is the hardest um, for us because it takes the most amount of time. You have to go in and think about taking and illustrating all of the things you're doing. When you're outside in the rain, it's you know 20 degrees out and you're in your muck boots and you're feeding the cattle. You don't think about pulling your cell phone out and taking a video of what you're doing. Um, but it's important to the customers to see what you're doing and how you're doing it um, and keeping that transparency with them. Uh, so it's the hardest for us, but it's the most effective. 
And so this study kind of helped um, solidify that and, and make us a little bit less disgruntled when we have to go out and take videos of the work that we're doing. And then use those boosted Facebook posts. Um, those are the, the easiest advertising method, I think, to step into and the most um, cost effective. And then as you get a little bit more comfortable with that, you may transition into radio advertisements, which cost a bit more money, um, but we're still successful, successful for us. But start small. Do we have any questions? I've allowed ample time and we can you know, talk about anything um, and everything that you guys um, have interest in. Facebook's okay. Um, so um, Donnie, it looks like you said that somebody had told you that um, LinkedIn, to use LinkedIn instead of Facebook, um, that you know people who use Facebook successfully. Um, you know, any of those social media profiles um, work. We are um, a little bit older. Uh, so we, we went for the Facebook uh, platform, but there's also Twitter. There's also YouTube. There's also Instagram. Um, LinkedIn, um, I, I haven't heard a whole lot about that in terms of like your businesses because it's more of people who are professionally networking, um, but you, it, it, there's no harm in trying. Um, but uh, YouTube is also a very successful area to utilize. And there's a lot of successful businesses that have um, very strong Instagram profiles. Um, but Facebook was the, um, and, and also you need to utilize the, the platform that your customer base is using. So for us, we had a lot of families um, that you know came to us for their meets. Um, and so Facebook was the most um, beneficial platform for us. Um, but if you are you know trying if you have a small coffee shop and you're targeting maybe college students or um, high school students or you know, young, younger um, inner city folks, you may look into Instagram um, or Twitter. One of those me mechanisms might be more successful for you. Uh, how often did you use your Facebook ads? Um, we, or how long did they run to? Um, we did um, three posts a week that we boosted, but we posted every day for 12 weeks. Um, so it was uh, $600 in total. Uh, so first off, I want to say thank you for this presentation. This, the topic is very interesting and very much needed. And the research methods and everything was great. I really enjoyed your presentation, the visuals. So thank you uh, for a job well done. Thank um, you. So I do have, and I don't know if those are like questions um, that you can answer or whether you were able to capture that in the, the study. Um, I was wondering if there were any type of demographic uh, differences in terms of where people were finding things out. Uh, if you were able to capture that, be, be it like Facebook or billboard, like were there any type of um, uh, demographic characteristic that was different in terms of um, what type of um, advertisement uh, was capturing people's attention? And another thing that I was wondering, and that might be difficult to capture, was how long did it take for people to um, reach out um, based on exposure? So how long must they have been exposed uh, to the ad before they decide, oh, I've been seeing this for a few times, mm -hmm. like I want to reach out. And I don't know if that's something that maybe I've been, um, anecdotally, you may have had a conversation with a customer about, well, I've been seeing this and then maybe after the second or third time I decided to reach out or whatever. Yeah. Um, so demographically, we um, we didn't capture as much of that as we wished we had. Um, looking back, we probably would have a little bit um, would have captured that differently. But Google Analytics was also helpful in getting the demographics from the customers who um, reached out in certain advertising methods, but not in all of them. Um, now we were able to talk with our customers when they would come and kind of just you know, hey, we heard that you heard about us through the billboard or through, you know, Google ads, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about that. And then when we were out and about prior to the pandemic um, with the um, craft shows and such, where we were meeting with customers on a face-to-face basis, um, they would say, hey, I saw your billboard ad, you know, I didn't buy back then, but um, I'm, I keep hearing your name or I keep 
seeing your name on the, hearing your name on the radio. And um, when I needed to buy meat, the stores were low. Um, I reached out and that was very, um, that was nice for us. And, and it took them a little while. Um, like I said, with the billboard advertisements, they didn't buy during that time period when we analyzed it. But later, um, after we finished out our, our experiment, so our experiment lasted for two years, we were able to capture some lingering sales later down the road um, that had said that they heard about us, um, but they were forced to buy because of the pandemic. Um, so did that answer your question? Yeah, I did. Thank you. You're welcome. How many members are in my cooperative and how do you meet and how often? And describe how you function as a co-op group. So we have four farm families currently. Um, we have about 300 head of cattle that we push through the cooperative. So about nine every two weeks go out um, to customers. Um, I think last year we finished out with a um, about 750,000 in sales. Um, so um, it's, it's growing. Each year we uh, continue to get bigger and bigger. I think the first year we had like 150,000 in sales. So that tells you over a you know, six year time period um, how much we've grown. Um, we are starting to look into um, adding additional members to our cooperatives. Um, we were able to service all of our customers with our current farms and the number of cattle that we had on our farms, but we are quickly approaching our limit. Um, but one of the benefits to a cooperative is that you can be a small footprint. So um, you, we have lots of small farms in our area, um, but service larger populations of people. So if you have 10 small farms that come together to provide a product for the population of people, you don't need these massive feedlots. Um, you can have small farms that have um, cattle that are um, well taken care of providing for our customers um, and on a consistent and reliable basis. So um, that was, that's what works for our co-op. Um, and we meet monthly. Um, we have a uh, Slack chat and a um, Voxer chat that we you know, talk about things on a daily basis when we all get time because several of us have off the farm jobs, um, but we, we meet on a monthly basis to take care of our business um, decisions. Did you vary your Facebook posts? And if so, did you notice any narratives that performed best? Um, we did. So we started off talking a little bit about who we were. Um, and then we would talk, we would kind of go gravitate towards the educational piece on you know, how we grind feed and how we move cattle and how we birth cattle and um, you know, what we feed our cattle and why. Um, and then you know, we would go into what kind of products did we have available and um, those types of areas. So um, we didn't have anything, we, the videos seem to be the most um, effective on social media for us. Um, that video that we created, it was um, extremely um, popular on our Facebook um, and anything, even the ones that we filmed on our own iPhones um, seem to grab our customers' attention. So videos were very, um, uh, effective for us. Um, and anytime that we talked about our product and um, what, what, how you can like the 10 different ways to cook a steak or um, five different crock pot recipes, those types of things, those were very um, effective for us. Nobody else does. I've got one more quick one. Could you go back over the um, class that you took about Google or and or whatever that class was that told you about your pages. I missed that. And uh, this has been super helpful, by the way. I'm gonna, I'm working with a group in Florida. You cut out at the end, but um, at, the, I, at the beginning, you asked what class um, we took to help us with Google ads. Is that, that correct? Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I was just then saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I had, um, I used LinkedIn Learning. It, it, was, it was called Linda at the time, um, but now I think it's called Link, LinkedIn Learning. And they have um, lots of courses out there on Google Analytics, as well as Google Ads um, to teach myself how to do it. Um, and then I think you can use Courses RA. I think they have some um, marketing um, classes out there on, on Google Analytics and um, Google Ads as well. But Linda.com, which is now LinkedIn Learning, um, is 
it's my go-to for that. Um, so uh, I would definitely take advantage of that when you can. And also look into your local chambers. Um, oftentimes they have classes on marketing strategies. Um, we do in Brown County. So I'd say a lot of um, counties in Ohio probably do as well. Um, our ABCAP helps us with that and offers classes on, you know, my Google business or Facebook or social media advertising. So look into those as well because um, they're very helpful. Get on their new their newsletter um, and um, you never know when something's going to pop up. I'll get something, you know, once a week and they'll have some training on there that might be interesting to me. And oftentimes they're virtual now. So um, I can hop in on my lunch break or from anywhere um, to learn a little bit about the topic that they're talking about. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And if any of you are interested in, in a cooperative yourself, um, I know there are some people who would ask questions about how we function. Um, Ohio State University South Centers is a great resource for that. We didn't know where to start and we reached out and they were able to help us to even create our articles of incorporation and our bylaws. Um, they taught us how to do our financial planning um, and what types of um, you know, stuff that we have to provide to the IRS on a yearly basis. Um, and they were able to um, point us in the direction of CPAs that can help us make sure that we're staying um, on task with the IRS as well. So um, utilize them because uh, they are a great resource. Oh, Ohio State University South Centers, um, so North South, um, they have their own website, I believe. Uh, so look that up. 